Right. So listen, one of the other stories I think that you've written about is natural gas. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a little bit of a bull on natural gas. Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, so far, I've been wrong. Uh, that, that happens sometimes early, sometimes wrong. Uh, my, my view is that if you look at what's happening in that gas, you have a couple factors in play. You know, to start with, conventional uh, nat gas production is actually in decline rapidly. That's because uh, below three dollars, no one makes money producing that gas. Then you have the shale guys, the Marcellus guys, Haynesville. They're growing, but their rate of growth is slowed dramatically because they don't make money producing that gas. They actually lose money on that gas, and they make some of it back on NGLs. But uh, effectively, they're not making much money. They're kind of treading water, breaking even, losing a bit, depending on what their hedge, look, hedge book looks like and how good their rocks are. And they funded this for a while with uh, debt, and the debt cut off. And a lot of these companies have gone to the shareholders and said, we're going to live within our means, which to a lot of shareholders basically says we're not going to grow anymore, which is probably a good thing, actually, because – to grow and not produce profits is kind of stupid. So where is all this net gas coming from? Well, it's coming from byproduct uh, oil, mainly shale. Now, when you look at the shale guys, a lot of the basins are slowing down. Um, you know, shale uses a lot of funny accounting. And when you really start going deep into it, at high prices, say 70, 75, they don't make money. We had uh, in Q3 2018, you had you know, mid 60s, high 60s oil price. None of these guys have positive cash flow. They don't make money at anything in the, in the realm of the current price deck. And I think eventually the capital is going to get cut off. It's already getting cut off. You're seeing PE guys stop funding. You're seeing credit spreads stay wide, despite the fact that oil is recovered. You've seen a lot of these guys in the Permian say they're going to slow their drilling. And so you're going to have less byproducts. You're still going to have byproducts, but the rate of uh, increase in byproducts is going to slow. On the demand side, you have a lot of LNG. You have uh, switching from uh, coal to nat gas. I don't think that's ever going backwards. You can have exports to Mexico if the Mexicans ever get their act together and build the pipelines. I just think you're going to see more demand. You're going to see uh, a reduction in the rate of growth of supply. And eventually it's going to normalize out where nat gas is higher than today's price. Because you can't have a commodity that is below the cost of production for too many years before you see a change. Going back to what I talked about with shipping, I always wait to see the inflection. This is all theoretical. I want to see this actually in, it inflected into the price of the underlying. So we had a big price uh, spike in uh, Q3 and Q4 of this year, uh, partly seasonal. You know, it was a very cold winter early on, partly because gas had been tight all summer. Uh, we're still below uh, historic averages right now. We're below you know, the five-year averages. We're below all sorts of metrics. Um, the expectation is that we will fill uh, reserves this summer. I'm skeptical. But we saw a spike. I got excited. I'm probably a year early. Maybe I'm two years early. I don't know. Uh, but I have a position. A lot of these companies have spiked quite a bit from uh, where I bought them. I've taken a little bit of it off. I've moved it around into the guys with a better balance sheet so I can see it out longer. But I have a position. It's a large position. I do think that gas goes higher. So uh, the spike from this uh, late uh, or early winter, that was the old uh, optionsellers.com guy, the guy that blew himself up. He was short <laughs> all sorts of all. And uh, we talked about that, yeah. you know, Patrick and I a couple of times. Uh, I think it was that was a case of uh, – you know, the VIX carry trade had kind of moved and morphed into the nat gas carry trade. And uh, it was just, it's, it was unbelievable, the kind of the violence of that spike. But it was actually even more shocking how quickly it was played out. Like, it, you know, it went uh, from three bucks to almost five, right back down to three, you know, before you could blink. Down to 250. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, 250 but or whatever. It would, right. So, Harris, one second. Can you tell me, what are the names? You mentioned you like ones with good balance sheet. This is my problem with anything not gas related. You know, if you're just trying to play the commodity, you know, the shape of the curve makes it really tough to own it outright. And so finding a good company to own is often a better way to play it than the actual owning the commodity. And I was wondering which ones, you know, you're more of a finance guy and going through the numbers. What are the, the names you like specifically on the companies? 
Sure. Um, I mean, just going back to the option traders, uh, optionsellers.com, I mean, he got himself caught in, uh, I guess, a mess. But um, I think there was something going on in the weather patterns that was a precipitating factor. You, know, you always eventually, when something happens in finance, you always see someone eventually lose a lot of money. It's just inevitable, and that gas is super volatile. But I think you, it was a weather thing that led to the blow up. And, you know, then you had a situation where the weather started getting very bearish and the net gas price pulled back. Um, in, in terms of names I like, uh, my favorite position is Sandridge. Uh, they're a very large producer. I mean, here's a funny story. Sandridge, a company where a guy named Tom Ward uh, spent $12 billion, $12 billion putting holes in the ground. Along the way, he bought himself a lot of toys. He spent $100 million on his headquarters building, uh, remodeling it. He built uh, midstream gathering systems. He built, you name it, he built it. And it all went to money heaven. Like literally just <laughs> money heaven. And people kept giving him capital, and he kept spending it. A lot of it he also took himself in salary and bonuses and other things, but $12 billion just disappeared. So it went into bankruptcy. And one of uh, Ward's disciples took over and went on the same trips. And they're producing a whole lot of not gas, but they're just wasting it all. So this really smart fella named Carl Icahn came along and said, this makes no sense. He got rid of the bad people. He put uh, five of his guys on the board. So they have five out of the eight seats. And he went in there and he said, let's cut costs because Icahn's a cost cutter. They've dramatically cut costs. They've moved some assets around. They sold bad assets, added some good ones. They've um, decided to go spend some money on drilling. Uh, I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of spending new money on drilling, but it is what it is. But effectively, right now, you have a company where after the cost cuts are all done, at today's commodity prices being 275 nat gas and call it 60 oil, I think you're looking at about $200 million of cash flow on a company with $225 million of market cap. Of that $225 million of market cap, you're looking at about $25 million of cash, and you're looking at the headquarters building being worth $100 million. And just talk about the headquarters building a little because it's kind of funny. Um, and I had some friends who know some real estate. They kind of appraised it at give or take $100 million. Um, but they spent $100 million just renovating it uh, about 10 years ago. They also spent, and I think a just about right. They spent about $26 million on a Zen garden where they bought a plot of land across the street and created a Zen garden. Well, I mean, if you have someone else's money, why not have a Zen garden? <laughs> they bought a park. Who nearby. doesn't have a Zen garden? I don't know about you. I have one. <laughs> they, they bought a fitness center across the way, which is now a boys and girls club. They just spent money on anything they could spend money on. So all this stuff sitting on the balance sheet but when you rearrange the balance sheet, you take the 225 million market cap, strip away the 25 of cash, strip away the 100 million of headquarters building, you're paying about 100 million bucks for 200 million of cash flow. And you're getting a midstream gathering system, which could probably be sold for some decent chunk of change. You're getting a bunch of other stuff in the balance sheet that we don't know about, injection wells or whatever else. And I mean, you're basically getting a lot of Mississippi lime wells that. They're not Miss, Miss Lime's not the best asset, especially at 275 net gas. It's a terrible asset. But the wells have already been drilled. They're low-ish cost to operate, not low, but low-ish. And they're producing a lot of net gas with a bit of oil. And that's just cash flow that's going to decline at some uh, double-digit rate. It's going to decline for a while, but you have a lot of value there. You also have a Northwest Stack where someone else is drilling the wells for you. And then finally, you have some Colorado assets, which have turned out to be a lot better than expected. They're spending a lot of money drilling wells there. That's where the $200 million is going each year. In two years, we'll learn if that's smart or not. Uh, I would rather see them do a buyback. But, hey, I'm not going to question the greatest uh, capital allocator of all time, Carl Icahn. Let him do what he's going to do. Uh, he's the largest shareholder, and I think he'll do something smart. 